So today we're going to go over houses without cripple walls. And first I'd like to show how you can tell if you have a house without cripple wall. First thing is you'll only have one or two steps that go up to the front door. And this is because there's no wall between the foundation and the floor you walk on. So for example, this blue arrow is the top of the foundation. The red arrow is the floor that you walk around on. And then this little space right here is the floor framing. There's no wall between the two. So let's go over these no cripple wall retrofits, how they work. So for example, this image right here, the red arrows represent the earthquake force. And this right in here, represents the floor joist foundation, etc. That's what is supporting the floor that you walk around on. So this is a crawl space. This is what it represents. There's the dirt right in here, crawl space, floor joist, and then the floor that you walk around on. And what we're trying to do is when the earthquake force tries to push the floor off the foundation, we want to make sure that it remains on the foundation so that in the event of an earthquake, the house floor and the foundation all move together so that when the shaking stops, they're intact. They just remain as one big piece. That's what we're trying to do in a seismic retrofit. Here I'd like to point out how foundation anchors work. So this is what we use to attach the mud sill to the foundation. So here's our mud sill, the bottom of the house. It's the very, very bottom of the house, the wood part. And then here's the foundation uh, itself. So what we do is we put in this thing here called the foundation anchor. And when earthquake force pushes this way on our mud sill, again, the bottom of the house, all these bolts right here prevent that from happening because the upper bolts are attached to the mud sill, the lower bolts are attached to the concrete, and so that prevents the mud sill from moving. So that's uh, one phase of our retrofit. Now there's some other ways to do that. It just depends on the configuration of the floor. We never know for sure which ones we're gonna use, but here's another type. This one right here, you know, it's the same thing. You can see the red arrow, that's the earthquake force. And then you can see the bolts, also shown by those red arrows. Earthquake force tries to move the mud sill off the foundation and the movement is prevented by the other style of foundation anchor. So here we have the exact same thing. This is the same sort of hardware. Earthquake force is trying to push the mud sill off the foundation. Counter force is provided by the foundation anchor. So exact same thing. Again, up here where it says floor you walk around on, and then this is the floor joist that's trying to be pushed as well. We're trying to keep all of that on the foundation. So we're going to go into, this is another style right here. This is one that's modern development, a little bit stronger than some of the old ones. And we use this one whenever they will fit. And then let's go down to this one. This is one that we use in situations where we need to put a shim between it and the mud sill. For example, here's a shim. And just to get this principle emphasized again, earthquake force comes this way. Counter force is provided by the foundation anchor. I want to go over something called a shear transfer tie. A shear transfer tie is a piece of steel. Here you can see the earthquake force coming here in the red arrow. Then there's this counter force provided by this black arrow, and that's the piece of steel called a framing anchor or shear transfer tie. So it's real simple again. Earthquake force comes this way, and counter force is provided by the shear transfer tie. So let's go down and we can see actual photograph of one. Earthquake force by the red arrow. Counter force provided by the shear transfer tie. And what that means is earthquake force comes here. It gets stopped by the shear transfer tie. Shear transfer tie is attached to the mud sill and the mud sill can't move because it's attached to the foundation with the foundation anchor. So here's an example again of the shear transfer ties. So this is the floor you walk around on up here and earthquake force is coming here, and you can see that it's trying to move the floor joist off the foundation, and then these pieces of steel prevent that from happening. Remember, the floor joist is underneath the floor that you're walking around on against this piece of wood right here. So we go down, and this is a house where you can see there was damage because there were no shear transfer ties, and there was a bad connection or a weak connection between this. This is the end joist. So this joist was not properly connected to this mud sill. So it slid, and it slid, you know, almost a foot. 
which is, which is quite a bit. This had significant damage. So I'd like to point out that this house was actually bolted. It was bolted quite well. These bolts are pretty close together. But even though it was bolted, it had uh, significant damage. So what we would do here is we would attach the joist right here to the mud sill to prevent that from happening. Now in the old days, before they had nail guns, there might be a joist that's 24 feet long with only three nails in it, two nails sometimes, because the carpenters were just trying to make sure the board didn't fall off while they were doing their construction. So oftentimes there's very, very weak connection at this point. And in these types of retrofits, that's always our most serious concern. That's where we really make sure that we make a good, strong connection. So I'd like to show you how the whole thing works. This is the earthquake force coming this way. That's the yellow arrow. That force then transfers into the shear transfer tie. Then that force it transfers into the foundation anchor. Again, if you go onto the website, you can read about this system and uh, think about it at your leisure until it's uh, clear to you. Next, I'd like to point out, sometimes we can't access the foundation. For so here, uh, this mud sill is embedded in the concrete. We can't take a piece of steel and attach it because it's embedded in concrete. So in these cases, we have to bolt a new mud sill to the side of the foundation. So at the same time, we use shear transfer ties up here at the top so that when the earthquake force pushes against the floor itself, that movement is transferred to our new mud sill, and then that is transferred to the bolt. So um, this is one way we have to do it if we go under a house and normal hardware won't work. We never know for sure what we're going to do until we're under the house. In the old days, they used to just put a house together, and it, it, if it didn't fall down, they, they said good enough. Here's one that's similar to that. In this case, the floor joists are running in this direction. In these cases, we have to use a piece of plywood, which is right here. We have to use this piece of plywood to attach the floor right here to our new mud sill, which is bolted to the side of the foundation. So this exact same system, but it's when the floor joists are going in a different direction. So we either use one where we make a direct connection with steel, or we use one where we have to use plywood. So I'll let you look at this at your leisure. This is one exact same thing. We have a new mud sill bolted to the side of the foundation. Uh, earthquake force comes like in the red arrow. Counter force is provided by this assembly with the shear transfer ties, the new mud sill, and the bolts. So there's a concern about retrofitting bolted homes. Is there anything you could do, anything you should do? Uh, I'd like to go over those. Houses are bolted as of 1958 on. It depends on the city. For example, San Jose was from 1927, uh, Fremont from December of 1956, and it just depends on the various cities. What we found is anything built after 1958 will be bolted. 57 is a transition year. Some are bolted, some aren't. I'd like to point out something about the California Building Code, which creates a problem that can result in significant earthquake damage. So right here, you'll see where it says connection. Uh, that's telling us that a connection between the joist and the sill, the joist again is the wood framing underneath the floor you walk on. So the connection between the joist and the sill can be made with three eight penny nails. So for example, here you can see earthquake forces pushing on this floor joist and legally even if this floor joist were 24 feet long you could just put in three nails so three nails is clearly inadequate i'd also like to point out that the code reads you know each joist shall have three nails so here's a joist here's a joist here's a joist here's a joist and that's a lot of nails because that's every 16 inches you'll find three nails um, so we don't worry about, you know, when the floor joists are perpendicular to the foundation, we don't worry so much. But where it's parallel to the foundation, such as right here, then there is a matter of concern. And so if you have a newer home and you're really concerned about earthquakes, that's a place to put your money. Okay, this is also a type of damage that occurs when the hole in the mud sill is significantly larger than the bolt itself. This is the rule rather than the exception. I would give it a 99% of the time when uh, I look at bolts that the holes are oversized. The reason they're oversized is when the carpenter is building the house, 
he makes the hole bigger than the bolt so then he can adjust the mud sill you know, to make it uh, flush with the foundation or put it wherever he wants to put it. If you get onto the website, again, at bayarearetrofit.com, I have an entire page on oversized bolt holes and what you can do to mitigate the problem that they cause. Now, the other place there might be a failure is in the building department inspections. The bolt is allowed to be a sixteenth of an inch smaller than the hole itself, and that's what the building code says. However, when an inspector comes out to check the bolts, he wants the washers on top of the nuts, so there's no way to even inspect it if he wanted to. So this is something where the building inspector would have to be conscientious enough to say, okay, I want you to take off the nuts before I pass this, but they don't do that. They just want to see that the bolts are there, that the nuts are there, and the washers are there, and then they pass it. So this sort of uh, problem with the oversized holes and the splitting and mud seals is very, very common in the Northridge earthquake, especially for the inspectors that did research there. This was probably the most common type of damage that they saw. So what you've learned up to now are the practical uh, aspects of retrofitting the house, bolts, plywood, shear transfer ties, etc. Now, in order to know how much of these components to use, you need to do some engineering. So this is the engineering we use and has been tailor-made for homes in the San Francisco Bay Area. They are the engineering basis behind a regional guideline called Standard Plan A. And even though they take some study to understand, they should be used because they are the most up-to-date, accurate, and comprehensive engineering calculations available in order to get the most effective retrofit you possibly can. So I'd like to go over a little bit about the engineering in a cripple wall retrofit. So this is like looking down at a house. This is the foundation line right here. We have 16,000 pounds of force attacking in all directions, and we have to resist that much force. So let's uh, pretend each one of these foundation anchors can resist 1,000 pounds. That's the red lines right there. So if we have eight of them right here, and we have eight of them right here, and the two, 8,000, 8,000 equals 16,000. So now earthquake force is coming there. We've resisted that. Half of the force will be resisted here. Half of the force will be resisted here. Same thing for earthquake forces coming in this direction. We need eight foundation anchors here. We need eight foundation anchors here. That also resists 16,000 pounds of force, which is what we're worried about. If you put in more than that, you really uh, wasted some hardware and some, obviously some money. Um, less than that and you might uh, compromise your retrofit and it might not work. So next we have to determine how many shear transfer ties to put in. So let's assume each of these shear transfer ties can resist 500 pounds of earthquake force. That would mean we need 8,000 pounds of resistance on each side. So we would need 16 shear transfer ties on this side, 16 shear transfer ties on this side, and so each side on the shear transfer tie side where uh, floor framing is connected to the mud sill, we need 16 at 500 pounds per piece of hardware, which equals 8,000 pounds here, 8,000 pounds here. We put 16 on this side, 8,000 pounds here, 8,000 pounds here, so that now this house can resist earthquake force of 16,000 pounds in all directions. I hope the information in this video has helped you understand more about seismic retrofitting and how to protect your own home. We're producing more videos, and if you would like to know when they are available, please click the subscribe button. Thank you.